Assalamu alaikum, good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of Talking Points. I'm your host, Saeed Niaz Ahmed. In our studios today, we have a gentleman who is Executive Director of Burma Human Rights Network. He has been our guest before, but with developments taking place every day, every night, and the situation of the Burmese uh, refugees in bordering countries uh, is getting not better, we hoped, but from bad to worse, you see. Uh, this organization, Burma Human Rights Network, was established some two, in, in 2012, but it was registered as a non-profit organization in 2015. Uh, the gentleman here is uh, Mr. Chua, Chua so Win, and uh, he's very active, meeting uh, different leaders in different countries and trying to raise sympathy with the United Nations. Welcome to tonight's program, sir. Thank How you are you? Me. Thank you so much. I know that you are not very, you don't live very far away, yeah. but it was still a long journey. No problem. My pleasure. How are things in, in Burma right now, and particularly in the refugee camps? Um, refugee camps in, uh, there are many in refugee camps in Burma. Yes. Uh, Bangladesh, yes. Bangladesh, uh, in a way that uh, there are quite a uh, variety of situations, right. if I may say. Uh, right now, the ICJ case is one of the top discussion points right, uh, and right, very see. interesting things. And uh, but the day is normal, normal life in in the camp is it still continue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the important things I would like to highlight here today yep. is uh, education. Right, education of children. <coughs> education. You said of that children. the the sixty percent of the occupants are, of the camp are children. Sixty percent of occupants are children, and also now it is two years already there in the camp. Yep and more than two years and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this meantime there are more new birth, new true, newborn, true, children. True, true. It's and a natural process. Yeah, it's a natural process and there are people's children are growing up and one of the dangerous point what we see here is um, children and youth yeah. bringing up without education. Right. These are the real threat for the for the security. Is, is there no program at all to keep them busy, to teach some, them something, there even, is even vocational training? Uh, there are very tiny percentage of, uh, to cover tiny percentage of the population mm -hmm. uh, as a small madrasas, religious schools, yeah. and there isn't proper schools yet. Right. So this is one of the very worrying signs for us. What, what we see here is they are, we are not sure when they are going back, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But we are all trying our best right. because they should deserve to go to return back to their home right to to get to to be protected to be the digni digni dignified right. way right. and and with that dignity and also one of the important thing is the accountability in what right. is going on in burma so all this if we sum up the situation it is not immediate return we see we don't see any, any immediate return of these true. people to the, to burma and also there are already couple of hundred of thousands already from those who have been living in 1978 in right. in, in bangladesh so there are refugee population is growing up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they need educations and this is because of the uh, it is it doesn't mean that they they will never return to burma if they get education right actually it it will assist <coughs> the economy okay when the population has education and they have everything they can move to other countries with proper education proper training yes but the thing is uh, the f to 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 go to the third country uh, I think Bangladesh government need to uh, arrange them for our help them with the discuss with the UNHCR mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and also the population right now is uh, uh, starving of the education. You mm -hmm. know yeah. that is a very um, worrying sign. Right, uh, uh, just to go back a little bit uh, in, in in terms of time, see, just to tell our viewers what is the real problem? Why did it start? And when did it start? And the Muslims have been living in Burma for centuries. For several centuries, of course. Uh, if you look at the... And who who uh, are the Rohingyans? Yeah. The Rohingyans, are the, if I pick up the one of the scholar, yeah. a British scholar who visited the Chittagong track, hill tracks during yeah. the uh, 18th century, mm -hmm. 1799 mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. He described the people as the people of uh, Muhammadan, meaning yeah, Muslims, Muslims yeah. and they called themselves Rohang people. Yes. 
and they are living they are with the dark skin and they are mm -hmm. living in a in a Chittagong hill tracks. So that means they are they've been living existing yeah, for, those centuries, centuries. for centuries. And also they look at that region. There is many times there are war and the refugees. It's not the first time it happening. Mm -hmm. It's several centuries there uh, you know there are more than hundred years the uh Arakan kingdom control Chittagong side and there are yeah. 200 years Chittagong side control Arakan side and during the Burmese annexation there were hundreds of thousands of people uh, you know fled Burma and, and Arakan mm -hmm. kingdom and then they shelter in Bangladesh in Chittagong and there were during the British colony time as well so there are a lot of changes happening in this uh, uh, movement of the populations between these two countries are uh, very very quite frequent so but in the history, right? But in 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 a way that uh, um, the border only happened after the independence. Yep. But before in that, people still crossing. 1947, and, and, yeah, and then from, then later 1952. Right. Yes, I mean that during that time, before that time, several centuries, people are uh, you know existing with, it, with it both sides and you know communicating, yep. tra trading, traveling each both sides. So th they exist. I mean, they are coexisted peacefully. Or different, uh, um, uh, what I say, uh, in, according to the time change, you know. Burma became independent in 1948. Yes. Uh, you have memories of uh, your time in Burma? Oh, yes. Yes. I spent 30 years in Burma. <laughs> How could I forget it? Yeah. And uh, what sort of memories do you have? I mean, uh, peaceful, turmoil, disturbances? Yes. yes. Um, as a childhood memory, um, it is a lovely country, you know, Burma is uh, full of uh, resources, promising. Mm -hmm. But uh, the racism and the religious discrimination has very deep. It's very deep and it's very widespread in Burma. You, you could feel that when you were there? Yes. During our school, during our childhood, when we play, mm -hmm. every time we, we feel that be uh, being treated different way. Yeah, there was no or segregation being, as such, but uh, there is a segre there, there isn't uh, very uh, badly the way which we have now in Rakhine City. Right. Not that way, but uh, there is a uh, you know discrimination. You could feel that. You, we could feel that, but in especially in the government offices, mm -hmm. if you go the woman, the moment they know that you are Muslim, then. Mm -hmm. The treatment mm. is totally different, right. and you need to pay more bribes. You need to yes. treat. You need to, you know, um, uh, treat them very special. Otherwise, you know, you you'll be ended up in trouble. But there was, I mean, I know segregation was there, discrimination was there, and probably in in a way it was racism. Yeah. <coughs> or religious uh, Islamophobia, as they say. Yeah. But. Uh, there was no killing, no raping, no torture, nothing like that. There is. There was. If you look at the 1942 in Rakhine State, when Japanese came, there were more than 100,000 Rohingya were been, been slaughtered. Yep. But that was during the war, isn't and it? During the World War II. And after that, 1978, 1991, you know, 2012, then go on. And Burma has... Uh, uh, that uh, religious problem uh, mm -hmm. with Muslims mm -hmm. and other things from 1938 mm -hmm. and 1936 there was an Indian riot to happen in, in Burma in Rangoon and then after that uh, and after two years they have a, they had a uh, we had a anti-Muslim violence in, in, in Burma but after that it become a political tools to mm -hmm. you know to use Muslim as a scapegoat for any political trouble they have they, uh, so General Nevin used very effectively, but on the on the other hand, General Nevin is a person who established is a long term strategy to eliminate Muslim from Burma. Uh, I can't understand it because Muslims have been there for centuries right yeah. now. So, did not didn't they make a place for themselves in the society, in politics, in in in, in, in all the professions? Oh yes, uh, if you look at the several centuries, uh, Muslims has been. In a you know very royal to the to the Burmese monarchy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the uh, king uh, he sent delegation to Mecca mm -hmm. to build a, a guest house for the Burmese Haji. Mm -hmm. 
So, which, so that that kind of relation we have, you know, Muslims in Burma as a re, uh, you know recognized mm -hmm. as a, one of the close et, uh, ally and ethnic of Burma, and also very they they, they enjoyed a lot of uh, uh, high position during mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, during the Burmese monarchy. Mm -hmm. But things changed after that. After British rule and after the independence, and and one of the key thing thing uh, we uh, we as we as assume that um, during the independence movement, yeah. nationalism is one of the driving force. Yes, of course. Right. But the moment when we get the independence, we need to divert this, but and we need to we need to come up with a different ideology and interpretations yes. to nation building. Right. But it never happened in Burma. Mm -hmm. So the moment we got a, in a, uh, uh, independence, they tried to go towards the Buddhist nations. Right. In that 1948, ideology. independence, but in yeah. 1962, military dictatorship. Yes. And in 2011, the dictatorship, military dictatorship is dissolved and in the name, and then there is a kind of a socialist government yeah. which establishes yes. it. And there was no place for Muslims in this setup. Yeah. That, if you look at the strategy, uh, what happened in uh, earlier time from 1962, in 1964, they nationalized everything, so all the Muslim has bankrupt, and uh, ma many Chinese as well, uh, not only Muslims. And the earlier the strategy was to exclude Muslim from the government structure. Mm -hmm. So all the Muslim uh, politicians, those who leaders, those they have been excluded from the government uh, structures, mm -hmm. and the military and police and. No Muslim in the military, no Muslim. All, all they remove the Muslim from the high The government jobs. The government jobs. And all those who are already there, they kept their career. So they cannot go beyond a certain level. Yes. And after that, there isn't any Muslim anymore. And in 1982, they drafted 1982 citizenship law. Mm -hmm. And this law is an enabler of the genocide. This law makes possible to commit genocide for them. You know, that's a very... Uh, this law is a very dangerous law that create uh, a lot of problems for the Muslims. What they did was uh, they and delisted Muslim from the uh, from the ethnic from ethnic of Burma, mm -hmm. and they degraded <coughs> the citizenship level. You know the third class citizens of, uh, of Burma. So because of 1982 citizenship law, um, Muslim lost ethnicity and lost a lot of citizenship rights. And gradually, gradually, now we have uh, in some area in Burma, the 70 to 80 percent or 90 percent Muslim population has no citizenships. That means this is a potential. They have no rights. There is a potential statelessness mm -hmm. still going on in Burma, and well, these uh, are the indicator of the genocide. Mr. Chauvin, we will have to take a break here, sure. and then when we come back, we will retrace our steps back to Rohingyans and Burma. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we'll be back soon after this short break. Thank you.